Let's take our Bibles this morning and go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 in your Bibles. And we're continuing with our series on Sunday mornings. We've entitled Victory in Jesus. We can have victory in our Christian lives. I think most of us, if, we, if you trusted Jesus as your Savior, I think we all believe we've got victory in Jesus. But my question for you this morning is, how much of it are we experiencing in our daily lives? Do we have victory over fear? We looked at that at the beginning of last month. We looked at victory over temptation. A few weeks ago, we saw victory over stress. Victory over national, national decline. Last week, if you were with us, we saw we can have victory over the culture in which we live. This morning, we're in 1 Peter chapter 4, and this book is the first letter that Peter writes to a group of churches, a group of, uh, of churches specifically to the Jews who were going through some difficult times, some persecution, you may say. They were uh, ones who had trusted Christ, but now they were being persecuted for it. Now they were wondering if they should stick with it or not, and he's encouraging them to stick with Christ. It'll work out. When we get to 1 Peter 4 and look down in verse number 12, the Bible says this, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he's evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet... If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Oswald Chambers wrote, Suffering is the heritage of the bad, of the penitent, and of the Son of God. Each one ends on the cross. The bad thief is crucified. The penitent thief is crucified. And the Son of God is crucified. By these signs we know the widespread heritage of suffering. I would say if there's a common thread that runs through the human race today, aside from our depravity and the sinful nature of man, it would be this, suffering. Every one of us faces difficulty, trials, adversity, that was also true in the first century when Peter wrote this to, to these churches. They were people who put their uh, placed their faith in Christ at a great personal risk. Adversity in our lives, it, you can liken it almost to a, a rock that's thrown into a still pond. There's a sudden impact, surely, and then a splash, but it doesn't end there, does it? There's a ripple effect that spreads and spreads further and further until it reaches the shoreline. Adversity in our lives can, can have a, a sudden drastic impact, but it also can last for weeks, months, even years. Difficulty and adversity arises with rippling effects but I want you to hear this morning, as we study God's word, we can see that it can be overcome through Jesus. We can have victory over adversity. For the next few moments, we're going to study this passage and a few other places in Scripture, how we can see that. And as we open uh, our preaching time now, let's ask the Lord's blessing at this time. Lord, we come to you grateful for the time we already had, uh, rejoicing and, and worshiping you in song. You're a holy God. It's amazing grace that saved us. Well, we, we ask for faith to trust you. It is so sweet to trust in you. Lord, we ask your blessing on uh, those in junior church now. And, and, and now as we open your word 
and, and study how we can have victory over adversity. It's not something the devil wants us to see or to have any part of. And we ask that you would uh, minimize the distractions in our minds and hearts. May we focus in on what you have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to see, in order to get victory over adversity, first of all this morning, the commonality of trials. Every true born-again believer will experience trials in life. If you've trusted Jesus, mark it down, there will be adversity in your life. Peter says it this way in verse 12. He said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try as though some strange thing happened unto you. He says, Don't be surprised. Don't be taken off guard when adversity comes. I would love to tell you this morning that as a Christian, give your life to Jesus and it'll all be sunshine and roses. But that's not the truth. I think about Peter's life. And as I was thinking about that this week, I remember back in Mark 8, as Jesus was talking to his disciples about what he was about to go through, how he was about to suffer on the cross and give his life, the Bible says that Peter rebuked him. Peter said, oh, Jesus, you don't need to do that. And Jesus' response to Peter was, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. He said, you're thinking about it from man's eyes. You've missed what God has. And I think that Peter got the message. At first, he thinks it's strange that Jesus would think of suffering now, later on in his life, as he writes this letter, he thinks it's strange that Christians would think of not suffering. He said, look, this is going to come. Adversity will come. The commonality of trials, adversity is expected in the life of a Christian. He's telling these believers, expect trials. You see, first century Christians new to be on guard. If you joined us on Sunday nights, we've gone through the first many chapters of Acts and what common thing we see is persecution as they follow Jesus. And they had to be on guard. And I think as Americans at times, if we're not careful, we've enjoyed freedom of religion for so long, we expect things to go smoothly. We have, if we're not careful, a Disneyland mentality of the Christian life. Every day should be happy. Christianity should, should fit into our idea of a good time. And the moment it doesn't, we hightail it out. Turn on just about any Christian television uh, program and it won't be long till you hear someone proclaim the idea that it's supposed to be smooth sailing every day. Especially if you send in money, right? You'll hear that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us that adversity is God's way of maturing a believer. Some young Christians, perhaps you, you can remember a time you first came to Christ and, and uh, started going to church and trying to do right and then suffer trials anyway. Some people are ready to give up on God because things aren't going the way they expected. And it's as if these people have signed up for a luxury cruise to heaven rather than signing up for duty on a battleship. The Bible tells us that Christian life is a war, spiritual warfare that we're fighting. Not everything's going to be easy. You think about a clay pot that's sitting in the sun. As long as it sits in the sun, it will always be a clay pot. But if you take that same clay pot and you place it in the white hot heat of a furnace, it will become beautiful porcelain. And a Christian who gives up when the going gets tough, when the uh, heat comes and their lives will never reach the full potential that God has in mind for them. So knowing and understanding the purpose of adversity, that God is using this to mold us, can help us persevere and be steadfast in the face of trials. You know, there are times I think, I don't want this adversity. Lord, let me learn another way. But he knows best. It's natural for us to want to question God. But it becomes wrong when we demand an answer from him. He's told us so much in his word that adversity will help us become more like him. The Bible says, when I'm tried and purified, I shall come forth 
as gold. Adversity is expected in the life of a Christian. Adversity is also, we see in Scripture, it's a proof of our salvation. The fact that we're being persecuted or facing adversity should not be a surprise. It's evidence if you're a child of God. Paul uh, described it in another place in Scripture as an evident token of our salvation. The writer in Hebrews, in Hebrews 12, uh, says that the chastisement of God is evidence that we're a son of his. That God dealeth with you as with sons, the Bible says, for whom he loveth he chasteneth, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. I would, uh, I enjoy other proofs of my salvation. I'm not going to uh, kid with you this morning, but adversity is one that is a proof of our salvation but not just the, the commonality of trials. I want us to get into really the meat of this this morning. I want us to see, second of all, the commendation to the Christian. What commands are we given in this passage as we face adversity? I'm glad that God never leaves us in the dark concerning how we should live. He gives us in his word the pathway we must follow if we're going to please him. So this passage in, in 1 Peter doesn't just warn us that adversity is coming, but it gives us the instruction and the tools to gain the victory over that adversity when it does come. What's the commendation to the Christian? I would say, first of all, that there's victory in identifying with Christ. Notice verse 13. He says, but rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering." That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Peter's telling these, these believers in this first century that if we would view uh, adversity from a biblical perspective, we can rejoice during these difficult circumstances. I hear that, and off the top, I'm thinking, really? Rejoice? You want me to be glad that I'm suffering because I'm trying to do right? You want me to be glad because I'm doing my best to live for God? I'm following this and I'm obeying here and I'm suffering. I'm supposed to rejoice in this. He tells them here that if a trial's come because we're serving the Lord and trying to live for Him, we're, we're being identified with Christ. And, and because we're being identified with Christ, I love Galatians 2.20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I... But Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so when these trials come, I can't put confidence in myself to fight my way through the difficulty. I don't know about you, but that's my personality. A problem comes, let's fix it, right? Let's figure it out and let's conquer it. Spiritually speaking, that's not the attitude we must have. Spiritually speaking, we must rely on the Lord to fight our battles in his strength. Pride will keep me, though, from that. From seeking God's help in overcoming adversity. Pride tells me I'm going to be self-reliant, self-sufficient. The world will tell you, look within you. Get in touch with that inner self. Think positive thought, all these things that are all about you and all about me. But I don't have the strength in myself to face the struggles of life. I can only find that strength when I look to Christ. There's victory in identifying with Christ. If we study the, the life of Christ, we, we had a whole series on it last year. And we called it Consider Christ. Consider how Christ did this and what he did here and how we should follow this. When we stop to consider Christ and how he suffered, we see a pattern. We're properly responding to adversity. He completed his work successfully. we got to focus on him. There's no victory without focusing on him. No matter what trial or adversity you and I are going to face today, this week, this year, there's joy set before us. As children of God. We also gain a perspective though. When it says rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. When I begin to think of how Christ suffered. No adversity that comes to me will ever compare. To what he went through. And what he did on our behalf. 
So we, we, we have Christ suffering in the perspective we gain from that. He suffered both public, both private humiliation as he endured the cross. And I'm not just referring to, hear me this morning, I'm not just referring to the suffering as he went to the cross. Because yes, he was beaten. And yes, he was mocked. And yes, he endured the cross and was stripped and hung on a, on a tree to die. But that's not the biggest adversity he faced. You understand the most adversity he faced was that he, he took our sin upon his shoulders. When a holy God died on the cross and, and he had to break fellowship for the only time in all of eternity with the Father, when the Father had to turn his back, he endured all that for us. I gain a perspective of my suffering when I view his, when I focus on him. There's victory in identifying with the cross, but there's also victory, I love this part of verse 14, in the presence of God. Notice verse 14. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Now, before we keep going, I haven't really taken much time to under, uh, help us understand that adversity. We're talking about adversity we face even though we're doing right. Yeah. Talking adversity that we may face at work. Talking about adversity we may face in our family or from other Christians or believers or, or things that we don't deserve. Things that, let me put it this way, aren't fair. Now, the truth of the matter is life isn't fair. And I, for one, am glad that it's not. Otherwise, I'd already be in hell today. Spiritually speaking, we have God's grace. But we're talking about things that, that we should not have to suffer through. We should not have to experience. The Bible says, if, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Here it is, verse 14. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. In the same way that God's presence and spirit rested upon Jesus, he says, I'll always be with you. If you're a persecuted follower of mine, I'm with you. You're going through difficulty that is undeserved because of me, I'm with you. In fact, Hebrews 13 says, I will Never leave you or forsake you. With you and God, watch this, you have a majority. I don't know what struggle you may be going through, but I want you to understand that God's word tells us if we're going through a struggle for his sake, his presence is with us. You see, peace, victory is not found in the absence of trouble. That's what I would like. Just no trouble. But that's not where peace and victory is found. Peace and victory is found in the presence of God. Yeah. And God says when you're going through adversity, when you're going through struggles, mark it down, I'm with you. I can give you peace in the midst of the storm. I'd love for the storm to go away. God says I'll give you peace in the midst of it. We should be thankful He's with us. Certainly when we face trials, we're not alone. Knowing the presence of Jesus is what gives me victory over adversity. You know, if we properly handle affliction in life, it'll make us stronger. How many of you this morning, maybe you want to raise your hand, maybe you don't. How many uh, in here this morning, let me turn this on, are uh, weightlifters? Anybody like to lift weights or go to the gym, work out? How many of you say, oh, I'm going to raise my hand and then I'm going to go home and do it this afternoon? So I'm like, oh, no, I'm just kidding. Some of you do that. Maybe you've seen that. A weightlifter will do what? He'll stretch and he'll strain in order to increase his strength. He'll go through some struggle, some pain. Perhaps if you've done some exercising, uh, here we are the second month. Maybe it was your... A New Year's resolution. Maybe, you, maybe you're still going strong. But you remember that next day after the first time exercising, oh my goodness, oh, is it worth it? Oh, we're going to do this anymore. You know, a weightlifter would be much more comfortable on the couch with a Diet Coke, right? Being healthy. But he's not going to gain any strength that way, is he? What does an athlete uh, typically say? Maybe you've heard it. No pain, no pain. Yeah, yeah. 
And the truth is, in our Christian lives, there is no growth without struggle. I would love to become more like Christ over the course of this week and month. You know the only way I'm going to do that? There's going to be some struggle. Growth comes from that. And so as I, as I do my best to, to look back over the course of life and over the course of last many years, and whether it be in ministry or whether it be with family, whether it be with my wife or my children, whether it be growing up as a teenager, as a young person, I look back over different situations and, and now I can see, maybe I don't understand some of it still. But I can see because this happened, I didn't like it while I was going through it. I, I was against it all this time, but I can see I've grown. I can see God has worked this for his glory. And what I can do is I look back and see that now as I go forward and God brings it into my life, I can think, you know, it may be tough. Probably not going to prefer it. But I know God's going to use this. I know God's going to strengthen me to become more like him. Oh, if I could choose, I'd probably choose another way. But his ways are not our ways, are they? The Bible says his thoughts are not our thoughts. I try to figure it out for him. God, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you just do this? Why, why couldn't we go this way? Why couldn't we do this and this direction? And His ways are not our ways. But what's his purpose? To conform us to the image of his son. God's concerned for you. If you've trusted him as your savior this morning, if you know he's living inside of your heart and you have eternal security of heaven, God wants you to be made like his son. And he wants me to be made like his son. And that adversity and the trials that we're facing, we can have victory over because his very presence is with us. We're identifying with Christ. We see the commonality of trials. We see the commendation to the Christian. But let me give you last of all this morning a caution to the Christian that's in this passage. There's a word of warning. Notice verse 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Remember, the uh, people whom he's writing to at this time were under a tyrannical government, an oppressive government. These people were facing the temptation to get revenge, to get even with those who were causing their affliction. I mean, these people were, were causing us to suffer and it's a government-run thing and it's not right and I want to get even with them. And he's saying, uh-uh, hey guys, uh-uh, don't even go down that road. A murderer, a thief, uh, an evildoer, or as a busybody, a meddler, in someone else's business. You know, maybe this is just me, but perhaps you faced the thought and it's easy for us to rationalize behaviors at certain times going through adversity. I'm suffering this and I shouldn't be. I'm going to get back. I'm going to try to get even. I'm going to say this or do this or I'm going to act this way and I can justify it because I don't deserve this. And the caution here to these believers was do right no matter what kind of circumstances we face. I don't know what's coming in the days ahead, uh, even in regards to our government and our, our setup. And, and, and we've seen perhaps over the course of these last uh, 9, 12 months, we ought not to take our freedom of religion lightly. And, and, and government can come in, and I'm not going to go down a certain rabbit trail other than to say the government is not responsible for our health. All right, going forward. And, and there's some things that we must follow and things that we must do. And then ultimately we have God's word to follow. And that's what we're going to do as his people. So th there's a caution here. What's the caution? First of all, it's to avoid self-imposed suffering. 
ready? Be honest. I think all of us can admit sometimes we bring suffering on ourselves. Not all adversity is a fiery trial that's sent from God. Let's be real. Sometimes we suffer as a consequence of something we've done or something we didn't do. Uh, if, if we go to work this week and lose our temper and mouth off to our boss, that suffering we endure is self-inflicted. Hear me. We're not suffering because of our faith. We're suffering because of our mouth, right? Uh, if, if we don't follow what God has said to do, if we don't obey his word and, 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 and live the, the way he commands us to live and we bring on suffering in our life, we can't go and claim, oh, I'm suffering for being a Christian. Oh, pray for me. Oh, God's going to use this to, to make me more like him. Oh, gosh. I've used that Latin word quite a few times here recently. That's not Latin. <laughs> Baloney, right? That's not a... If we're doing things and bringing suffering on ourselves, we need to change our behavior. Suffering as a result of living for Christ and trying to be more like Him, we rejoice in. Suffering because we've done wrong or didn't do something we should, we don't rejoice in that, we change our behavior. And he has to tell these people this, and, and this time, this first century Christian, he said, look, be careful, don't bring suffering on yourself. The Bible teaches us that sin will nullify our witness for Christ. I, I, I was reading earlier this morning, up earlier in this chapter. Look up in verse number three. He says, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. Notice verse four. Wherein... They think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. What's he saying? Those people that aren't following God, when you don't continue in a life of sin with them, they're taking notice. They're taking notice that you're living differently. They're taking notice that God's done something in your heart. And it's not something that they're going to praise you for, but it's something they're taking notice of. And the moment that we sin and do what we want, we've nullified our witness for Christ. However, being a faithful Christian, living for the Lord, if that brings an attack against us, we ought to rejoice. I think of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, around verses 10, 11, and 12. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. Well, what's he say? Rejoice. You partakers of Christ's suffering pretty much the same passage that we have here. If there's something that adversity does, watch this, it platforms us. See, what do you mean? We have up here a platform. What does it do? It just makes, lifts things higher. Makes it easier to see. Focus attention there. That's what trials and adversity does in your life and in my life. And other people can easily see. And are watching. Sin in our life nullifies that witness. But understanding that adversity God has brought to make us more like Him gives us a testimony. Avoid self-imposed suffering. The caution also is to honor Christ when suffering for his sake. Notice verse number 16, the last one in our passage. He says, yet if any man suffer as a Christian. You know, I believe this is the third and only the uh, and the final time that the word Christian is mentioned in the New Testament. A Christian is a follower of Christ. One who follows Christ. Christ. So he said, if because of your testimony of following Christ, you suffer, watch, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. There's no shame. There's no disgrace and adversity caused by a faithful witness for Jesus. Obedience to God's word. Don't be ashamed of Christ. Think about who's writing this. This is the letter of first who? Peter. 
is saying, don't be ashamed of Christ. You following? Remember what he did near the end of Jesus' life? He denied him. He was ashamed. He was ashamed that he followed him. He denied him three times, even with an oath. He failed miserably. But later on, he had an opportunity to follow again. And he took it. And Christ welcomed him with open arms. Oh, I love that. I love it when, when, when Jesus was cooking the fish and saw the disciples after his resurrection, he said, come on, join me. He didn't harp on Peter. Peter, I can't believe, just a few days ago, after I told you all oh, that I told you, you denied me? Seriously, Peter? That's what I would have done. You've been following me closely for three and a half years. You've seen who I am. You've seen my test. And then you go and deny me on my toughest night. That's not what Jesus did. He just looked at him after he fed him. Peter, do you love me? What's Peter saying again? Lord, you know I love you. I can just imagine Peter hanging his head. I do, Lord. You know that I do. I didn't show it. Here, later on in life, he's saying, Christian, don't be ashamed. Rejoice. Rejoice. Don't, don't be ashamed. Paul said it this way in 2 Timothy 1. We were in that passage last week. He said, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. The only way, though, Hear me, the only way you and I can face adversity and trials and difficulty in life and not be ashamed is by having a personal relationship, close relationship with Jesus. That's the only thing that's going to get you through. Paul wasn't ashamed of his sufferings. I think about uh, Paul in, in Philippians 3, one of my favorite verses, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, what's the next phrase? And the fellowship of his suffering. Think about it. The fellowship of suffering. God, you went through this. God, I'm suffering. No, it's nothing compared to what you did, but you know that I don't deserve it. You know that this is coming in and, and I, I'm suffering because of it. And there's a sweet fellowship that we can have with Jesus only during those times. Don't be ashamed, but glorify God. While Christ was on earth, he glorified the Father. As he was with the disciples in the upper room, he, he prayed, I have glorified thee on earth. I finished the work which thou gavest me to do. It's our responsibility to bring glory to God. I want you to look one more place in Scripture as we close. Matthew chapter 5. Turn there with me if you would. I mentioned a few verses from the Sermon on the Mount just a little earlier. We're going to look at a different part of Matthew 5. I wouldn't choose it. I'm sorry that we have it, but God knows better. How do we get victory over adversity? Understand there's commonality in trials. There's a, there's a command given to us as Christians, and then there's a caution. In Matthew 5, notice verse 13. In fact, let's go back up for, to verse 10. It comes right after what I mentioned. Verse 10, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. Be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now notice verse 13. You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Hey, he's saying that you're, you're supposed to provide something, but if you've lost your savor, where, where's it going to come from? It is thenceforth, verse 13, good for nothing but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. Verse 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. What's it saying? You've been platformed. You're a light. Verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Here it is. And glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
Jesus is, is teaching his disciples here in these few chapters. He said, look, there's going to be things you go through. And as soon as he talks about blessing for, for those who are persecuted, he said, you've got a purpose here. You've got to be salt. You've got to be a light. It's a dark world. You've got to shine. Let your light shine. Not so that others can look at you and think much of you, but so that they can look at you and glorify me. Peter was calling the believers in his day, stand firm for what's right. The Bible's telling us, proclaim that Jesus is Lord. It may cause us suffering. It may cause us adversity. But we'll never go through it alone. Stand firmly, unashamedly, and claim his victory over adversity. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.